Okay, thanks. All right. So anyway, maybe it's better not to have that part in anyway. So, <laughs> so the class for this time, who is A35 whatever? Who is that? Professor, it's me. I was um, getting oh. connected by my laptop and my, the name was A35. I, I will change it. Okay. I mean, now you're new chat, so no problem. Um, anyway, I think I need to adjust my teaching because I think uh, there are seven or eight students that are doing fine. But I do think that today is not gonna be simply a review. The students who have kept up will still will have a lot of answers to give to the questions. They will add a lot to what they already know. So I don't think anybody is going to learn less for what we're doing today. It's just that you're going to digest it more, apply it more, and see why I assigned one thing after another, right? Because I am asking you to do a lot of the thinking on your own, and it's so much easier in a classroom. So this is what we're going to do. Get out a piece of paper, and I will share the screen, and we will just start at the beginning. And what I'll do is ask you, constantly ask you questions where I ask you to apply the material to some example. So that's what you'll hand in for next time, for your next post, just to give you an example. Well, I did revise the syllabus a bit. So the readings, okay, so here's where we've been. We've been on Aristotle, we've been on um, the strength of mind, the Stoics. We've been on um, Augustine, eternal law, mathematics, free will. We've been St. Thomas uniting Aristotle and Pope Francis and Martin Luther King. We've been on utilitarianism and I separated that into two things. One are the original ideas. The next one is the way they're applied. Then where we did Kant or we're leading up to Kant, some poor students thought she had to write on Kant already. And that's jumping ahead. You really didn't have to do that. Um, and then we'll do Benedict. Then there'll be a paper due. So that's another reason why I'm going to go back over it and give you a whole lot of notes. So you'll have all your notes and you can look over your notes, your post, and think, what do I want to write my paper on? All right. It's not a long paper. It doesn't have to do any extra research. The reason I assign these things is I want you to distinguish between a post that simply describes an application it doesn't end a paper that has a thesis statement with paragraphs that all have to go back, right? So it's a lot of the same material, but it's organized in a different way. And that's important because if you, in school, you tend to get asked to write papers, but if you end up just writing a bunch of posts, it's not going to wash, <laughs> okay? So that's why I do it this way. So this is where we're at. Um, and if after you finish this paper, in addition to the daily assignments, you should be starting on a research paper. Again, it's not real long. It does ask for three outside references. And it's very open in terms of the topic. But if you want to study some kind of therapy or drug treatment, some branch of psychology as it's uh, taught or exercised today, and then you can compare and contrast with what we've been doing in philosophy. Because I do talk about political things a lot, but I think they they affect your psyche, 
right? And I do think the discipline of psychology tends not, you know, it tends to focus on individual pleasures and pains, right? Rather than on how the culture as a whole is all interconnected. So anyway, I for this class, however, for you to, if you want to just get more informed about the more popular views, then you can understand the philosophy behind those views. And that's what I'd like you to bring in at least in one or two paragraphs of your paper. So, and then we'll, and then we have a final paper. So that's how it works. Um, but this is how the assignment for today is going to work. So let me just give you an example. All right. All of you, I'm sure, know something about the United Nations. So what I want you to write down is some example of where the United Nations came into your country to develop the country, or if they came in with a peace mission to try and prevent a war or stop a war, or if you just know things about the UN apart from its interventions in your country. So I'm just going to give you um, some time to write down some example, something you've heard about the UN or you know about the UN. And then do you think it was a good intervention or, you know, were they trying to do something you didn't like? Did it, good, did it get a good uh, reputation from the press? You know, did the press describe the UN's participation or intervention positively or negatively? So let me just give you a little bit of time to process that. Does everybody, does everybody understand this? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You know, if anybody has a question, because I've just thrown all this stuff at you and I haven't given you a chance to process it, I don't think. Um, so that's what I'm going to give you right now. Um, so just take some time and I will move on. So I'll, you know, I'll give you a minute or two and then we'll move on. So jot down notes enough so that you can, when you come to type it, you'll know what you said. <laughs> Let me see, how can I know when people are finished? Do we give a signal of some sort? All right, so I'm also going to, this was the doctrine of rights. So when people talk about the UN, do they talk about rights? Or when they talk about the UN, they probably don't use the language of capabilities, but are they talking about whether the UN's intervention facil facil facilitates the development of these capabilities, right? Does it make sense to you that the UN underneath the rights language is actually measuring how are people actually living are they able to develop themselves at a higher level, right? So that's the UN question. All right. Then the next thing would be Aristotle's virtues. I, I don't think I need to give you more time on that, except that I could, how could you picture, or do you have an example of how somebody tells you, you know, gives you the impression 
that they have practical wisdom. Maybe you had a teacher, maybe you had some other adult, but maybe you had a Westerner who has sort of intimidated you into thinking they know they're more virtuous than you, they're more informed about politics than you, they're capable of making better decisions than you, and then, or they're smarter than you, um, but it was intimidating and you find out later that it was a tool for controlling you or that some national leaders from the West or from China, I don't know, from somewhere else came in and um, used the language of practical wisdom in order to get you or your country to do stuff and it really, it really was might makes right. Underneath that, they were exploiting you, but they were using the language of practical wisdom. So see, I'll give you, if you can't think in of, of an abuse of it, uh, a number of you have already written examples, but during the time I give you, if you can't think of a way it's been abused or anticipate a way it's been abused, you could just write another example. Just add to whatever you've said already. So we'll give you a few minutes on that. You're done, may wish. That's Professor, good. How, yeah. Sorry. Professor, how long should we write? Well, what you need to do is um, just jot down notes because your post is going to be, you know, the whole, you explain it to me. Um, so, I guess just as long as the amount of time I give you, you know, I don't have a maximum amount. So <laughs> I just want everyone in the class to make some associations, right? So they don't feel lost and they don't panic. Okay, that's the main thing. Um, and we will get to political virtues in a minute again, right? All right. Now, here's the next thing. Can you understand how I've been talking about a paradigm shift from ancient points of view? This was um, Aristotle, Seneca, Augustine, Aquinas right? And then we shifted to modern science, empiricism, utilitarianism. Um, we didn't do Locke in this class, but a human rights doctrine, right? The United Nations, and then Kant. Okay, so just, just write down for me Yes, Dr. Beck, Professor Beck, I understand that, or I don't have a clue, or um, why, why I would think it's important, right? Or you can, what you've studied psychology previously is definitely a modern model of the human the blank slate, um, or you could write about you were raised under religion, which had a very different view of the psyche and a healthy psyche. And then when you come to AUW and you study this modern stuff, it has a very different view of the psyche. And so you get confused. <laughs> I, Right? How am I supposed to teach myself how to live? 
pleasure, pain, and happiness or sin, right? And fear, right? So if you want to comment a little bit on that you understand psychologically this, this difference and that you are caught, right? You're going to have to rethink things and come up with your own view because the grown-ups in the room are having a food fight about this, right? <laughs> they, they're throwing, you know, stuff at each other and students are caught in the middle. I hope you understand why I feel sorry for you about that. I think we hand you a very confusing um, mix, mis, you know, mix of worldviews and never give you a chance to sort it out. So if you could just comment a little bit on, you know, first thoughts about the paradigm shift based on old science versus new science. Um, okay, let's see. Old science was united with religion, focused on cycles of life. The goal is wisdom. Our place is not to manipulate nature, it's to understand it. We focus on the old paradigm authority is natural. Sexism um, is natural. Um, tradition, family, hierarchy, religion, okay? The new paradigm, different science, scientific method, economics is industry, technology, progress. The goal is to exploit nature for human well-being, focus on equality, freedom. Uh, families are more individuals, you know, with their own pleasures and pains and happiness. Um, they try to get away from inherited wealth so you can earn your way into your social place in the social hierarchy. And they also separate church and state so that when you come to AUW, we don't uh, select you, you know, the religion is we're indifferent, right? We treat people from any religion or secular humanists equally. We don't respect inherited privilege. We pull you away from your family and we want you, you know, we believe this is progress, whatever. So you're caught between worlds and you have to think about. So I'll give you just a, a little bit more time and then we'll move on. Okay, so that was all the stuff I threw at you the first day. Then, this is what I threw at you the second day. Um, the letter, um, if you all want to write a letter to your friend, again, I'm not going to assign this again. Uh, I'll just cut five pages or something. But if you remember, it was a letter to a friend and it did implicitly have all those virtues and the friend was vacillating and anxious, depressed, you know, a lot of the things that would be diagnosed today, but they didn't have all this, you know, therapies and data. They just had to deal with it. So um, he's asking for some help from his friend to get focused. Um, so my question here is, um, 
Can you think of an example where you had conversations with a friend and you, you know, this is psychology and you, um, it was, you sought advice about how to gain some strength of mind, right? The way that Serenus does for Seneca. Can you think of an example of that? Maybe you didn't write a letter because nobody writes letters anymore, <laughs> but you had a conversation. Okay, so that would be one thing. And that is what you could write your first paper on, just a long extended version of that. And the second thing from this lecture was the different kinds of suffering. Um, so analyzing the source of the suffering, the type of suffering, whether it was, whether you could control it or not, right? Some health problems are genetic. You just have to have strength of mind. Some are the result of your own bad habits. Some are just a matter of luck. You happen to walk in front of a car and, you know, got hurt seriously, but there wasn't anything you did. It was just accident. Um, and then basically awareness of how easily we can suffer physically, how easy it is to get sick. Um, so that developing some sort of strength of mind in the face of our physical vulnerability, that's part of life. Then we have um, the fact that people made choices before us climate choices, but family choices, right? Within a family, there are leftover bad blood or good blood, right? Or in your country, people made choices that have, weren't your fault, but you have to deal with them. And then you have to decide what choices do I wanna make so that the next generation would have a chance, right? So I'm gonna, go through this list. You don't have to write an example of every single thing. I just wanted to go over the whole class with you so that you know, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Um, okay, accidents are not God's will. When you unite reason and faith, the reason the car hit you is not, God didn't plan that. It's just human life involves a lot of accidents. Um, natural disasters. Again, on the uniting of reason and faith, God doesn't cause hurricanes or cyclones or droughts. Those are caused by us, right? The extreme climate situations are caused by human greed, human choice. The natural cyclones and whatever at the natural level are just part of life. It's not nature's fault that you happen to live where there are cyclones, right? So nature is, oh, Esther, I like Esther. I'm going to have the cyclone over here. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. Um, so when you unite reason and faith, you don't have this particular God having some vendetta or something. Um, then there's psychological suffering. Some of that is caused by your denial of your vulnerability, 
your ignorance of the human place in the universe. Some of it is um, caused by just lack of understanding of what it means to be healthy, right? What you accept that you can't change and change what you can. Um, and then there's the suffering caused by the fact that we depend on people and we love them, right? And then, of course, they can hurt us or we can hurt them, right? Um, and then the question there is, would you rather live in a world where we're all robots <laughs> or we all take drugs, you know, all day and just sort of pacify ourselves? So we don't depend on each other. We don't need each other because then we can't hurt each other. You know, so is the world a better place because we actually love and need and care about each other, but also we make mistakes. So that's another point. Sorry, Professor. Yep. So what was the main question for this part? It's just you thinking of examples, right? Okay, so if we, if we talk about these all things that you mentioned, so that will go out, right? Well, whatever you have time to jot down notes, right? You certainly can, but you don't have to, right? Because I'm not gonna give you enough time to write everything, but if you want to jot down notes and write more, I, I'm giving you an opportunity to weave the class together. And so it's up to you how much of that you want to do. Okay, okay, sure. But that's a good question. That's a fine question. Um, so the issue there is a perfect world inevitably involves a lot of suffering. It's just the way the human condition is. But how much unnecessary suffering is caused by injustice, right? Racism, sexism, greed, um, abuse, and um, unnecessary disease, right? Diseases caused because people didn't have enough money to get the medicine. Um, okay, so how about children who grow up crippled either by too much wealth, they get too full of themselves, or um, too little wealth, right? They get afraid, they're basically constantly in a state of PTSD. <laughs> because they're so frightened by life. Um, all right. So distinguishing, I have, you know, there's a lot of students in my school who are African-American and their parents just tell them, you know, tough it up, you can do it. Don't feel sorry for yourself. You know, you don't wanna blame anybody. But the trouble is, this, if, if the deck is stacked, right? If somebody doesn't hire you because of your race, but they don't, you know, they cover it up. I, th I don't think you should blame yourself, right? You can't control it. You can't get really angry at them, but, but you must be able to identify when injustice is the cause and then figure out what to do about it. But don't blame yourself because, I mean, that's just letting the other guy off the hook, you know, that Martin Luther King had to deal with that, right? How do you go about changing the system without causing even more problems and unnecessary suffering? That's very difficult. But certainly it's hard if you don't think it through. So in this class, I just ask you to start, start thinking these things through in all of their complexity. So the legislative process, the laws, 
might be the problem. The judges or juries who apply the laws might be the problem. And if you can think of examples while I'm talking, right? How about law enforcement? Is it very punitive or do the prisons and jails try to rehabilitate people so that they can get back on their feet? Um, all right. So how should an engaged citizen think about the suffering in their society and the causes behind it? and how to make a better society going forward. So I'll just stop for a minute. So another layer <laughs> of interaction. So this is where I can say some posts get more complex than others. So what happens if the United Nations comes into a country and tries to help, right? Are they trying to, for example, they want to improve the situation, but the political leaders are so corrupt that when they try to work with them, everything they do is, is perverted to the advantage of the political leaders, right? So, so that's where you can start putting this stuff together, right? How can the UN come into a country study the different kinds of suffering in that country, figure out what they actually could help, how they actually could help. And then when is it they're trying to fix something they can't fix? Um, luckily, I think in most of your countries, the UN is distributing vaccines, right? As fast as possible. And the people in your countries, I think, are taking them. <laughs> Not like my country. But anyway, I think that might be a good example of where the UN is really helpful, really effective. I'm not quite sure. I know that UNICEF, I get their emails and they're doing a lot. And I know that um, Brock, right, the Bangladeshi NGO, um, so this is just systematically looking at these things in a context. And you can use COVID, that's a great example. If you want to write a whole paper on COVID and human suffering, right? How much of this is caused by how interconnected we are? Um, is that good or bad? Um, anyway, if you wanted to do that, it would be very interesting to, for me to read. And it, then it would be this exercise in you trying to look at one issue in the context of the human condition and suffering. Okay. All right. So that was the next thing that I threw at you. Do you have a question, Pooja? No, Professor, it was by mistake, sorry. Oh, that's all right. Um, so this was the entry examples. I gave you some are more complex than others. So if you just say today we read this, that's not very complex. Um, if you just said, I like this, I didn't like that, 
Um, that's what my parents taught me. It's okay, but it's, you know, a C. <laughs> then if you start thinking, okay, is this based on the human condition or is this just my country or my family, right? You start separating out which things we study that you think are just relative to your situation or human beings at this point in history as opposed to the past and how much is it, oh, the same patterns are coming back, right? And then the last one is where you, you know, you add other things you're learning from class or you add the UN and human suffering or COVID, you know, you just start weaving things together at a higher and higher level. So that's what I'm getting at with the posts. So I hope after the end of today, then that'll be a little more obvious to you. Um, okay. All right. Then the next thing was Augustine. And that was, I think you remember, you know, the main issue was the, the issues I want to get at are the history of the union of reason and faith. And the fact that there's certain kinds of thinking that I think if you're raised Muslim, you could easily have been raised with those same kind of ideas and arguments. Um, and some of you did say that, that this is a lot like the intellectual theology that I got, right? So Muslim, Christian and Jewish have this personal God. Well, the thing about this union of reason and faith is that the word God does not have to be single, monism. So some of my students, some of the students that are Buddhist or Hindu or Confucian or secular say, I didn't get any of this. This is completely, <laughs> this is not my cultural heritage because we had karma and we had multiple gods and we were not supposed to focus on one right because that's obsessive behavior we were supposed to just go with the flow which is great for it's great for you to realize that right that's what i want you to do you just go oh <laughs> yeah i didn't get this and um and others will realize, wow, this is sort of, you know, even if you're secular, you could go through these arguments in your head because they make sense. And people do math, and then you can make this leap from math into this whole view of reality. So just, just to let you know that intellectually, there's certain, certain uh, intellectual trains of reasoning that are pretty old <laughs> and that once human beings had gotten to a certain level of complexity in their civilization, it was sort of natural to entertain these ideas. Um, okay, so that was the one thing. If, okay, so I guess, what shall you write? I guess, you could just write, did that line of reasoning make any sense to you? And did you learn something about yourself from the fact that it either did or didn't, <laughs> right? You just learn about yourself and the way your mind works. Truth and the natural world human judgment, human affairs, these basic principles in human affairs, the notion of justice, um, okay. Do we have this natural idea, like when a little kid 
uh, when you're cutting a piece of pie or dessert or something, oh boy, if you don't cut it exactly the same, that's not fair. <laughs> Where do they get that idea, right? I mean, they see it even if they haven't been treated fairly, right? Their whole life, they'll just eat, eat. Um, and it isn't necessarily self-interest. It can be just the notion that, okay, you're you, I'm me, same size, right? Where did they get that? Okay, so that's that. And then the story of the woman raising her kids. Now, I think it's very interesting because I got posts about this and the students really had different responses, right? Some of them were incredibly relieved. They said, yeah, I grew up with guilt and now I know I don't need to, right? And some of them will say, oh, you can have religious virtues. You can have Aristotle's virtues without guilt. And some say, um, yeah, that's why I became a secular humanist. This sounds better. <laughs> or that's why I have a friend that just threw out religion. And then others say, no, no, I disagree with her. I think you should grow up with a sense of sin, right? And I grew up with that and it's very comforting, right? And it gives me direction. So, so that's fascinating to me. But my main thing by asking you to react to it, my goal is to help you understand you. Okay, so I'll give you a minute. Uh, what was your takeaway, either about that concept of eternal truth or about raising your kids with sin or both, whatever you have time for? But those were the main things in this particular lecture. Another thing you could think about now that we've gone further ahead is does the different kind of conditioning, is that an argument for the blank slate? Or can you give, did this woman give her children a moral foundation? that is that is based on the human condition that enables children to flourish. So I would say that she raised her kids with secular humanism, but also to care about social justice. So I would call that spiritual humanism. So I think the way she raised her kids was consistent with Aristotle's virtues, but you could also be Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, anything, and raise your kids with those virtues. And then the question is, can you raise a kid to take pleasure in doing good things without a trace of fear and sin, right? Or is that impossible, right? Um, okay. Professor, can you uh, say again the question? Because at the half of the... Right. Do you think that this issue of how to raise your kids is, shows that we're born blank 
and we can get molded anyway, or that some ways of molding kids actually fit their nature as a, as a kind of creature or a kind of being. And in some kinds of habits, enable them to flourish as adults better than others. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, Professor, thank you. Sure. And people just disagree. I had students whose parents said, spare the rod, spoil the child. If you don't threaten to beat your kid and make good on it, if they do bad things, they'll grow up spoiled and self-indulgent, right? Whereas this woman thought, yeah. <laughs> okay. She did have a moral code, one she followed not from obligation, but from her own desire to make the world a better place. So that's how Aristotle said, you know, take kids that raise kids to take pleasure in doing good. All right. The other possibility is that's too weak. Like when these children are actually confronted with a more complex world and when they grow up and when they have all these temptations, they haven't even gone through puberty yet, right? That they're not gonna have the moral strength. They're not gonna be afraid enough <laughs> to behave. That, that's what you know an Augustinian would say, right? And you know, you don't have, you can maybe have a definitive opinion, but you could just say, uh, you know, I understand the problem, or I'm not sure, but here are my reflections on that. Okay, so that was my main take on that. What is a healthy psyche, right? Does it, does it need the grace of God and the idea of sin, or does it just need to get trained to love virtue? Okay. Then the next day was the Catholic Church united Aristotle with a, a belief, well, monism, I'll just say monism, so that this includes uh, Islam and uh, Judaism and some, you know, other religions might think that all the gods, actually there's a hierarchy of gods and they sort of all end up with one or no, you're not supposed to have just one because it gets you, it gets you too emotionally repressed, intellectually obsessed, it's not healthy. Right, that would be the other point of view. But um, we did do those proofs for God, but I'll spare you if anybody's interested. I had some students that I think kind of freaked out and I don't wanna scare them. It's, but I had other students for whom it seemed pretty natural. So, you know, if you wanna pursue that further, you could do it in office hours. This is the one I wanted to emphasize. Um, the Benedictine values, these are the, the sisters that I live with. Do you think those are universal values? And then Pope Francis. So now we're back to the UN again, right? We're back to where we started, but now we have another layer, right? So. This is the world that you live in, right? The UN has been there since 1945 and it will be there your whole life, I think. And they, it will have that same philosophy, but their interventions, their practical wisdom, their applications will vary quite a bit. And so, um, so then the next question is, what's the, 
connection between one billion people and the Catholic Church. And then you can think about, well, what about those, I think it's almost a billion Muslims, and can they all work together on these issues? Do they basically agree on those principles? So we'll go uh, back there and America, right? He's lecturing us because we're not doing a very good job of, I mean, we, we uh, were major, we were the major player in the formation of the United Nations. And we also are the country that most often uh, ignores them and go flies in the face of what they decide. So the next step is for you to distinguish between a religious doctrine and authentic religious values or beliefs. So on St. Francis, it's the Aristotelian virtues are the virtues every religion should cultivate. When it's authentic, that's what it does. And its view of God should be inclusive. If there is one and it's God is infinitely good, God is not going to be a bigot. <laughs> God is not going to say, okay, I favor you and you can, you're going to hell unless you convert, you know, just none of that. So you can wrestle with, do you think religious bigotry? favoring one church and doctrine over another. Do you agree with that or not? Um, do you judge somebody just because of the religion that they belong to rather than because whether they're virtuous or not? The next one is partisan bickering. Do the political parties in your countries just complain about each other and not get anything done? Can you think of examples of that? What about immigrants? What is your experience with that? And then obviously in Bangladesh, the refugees are the result of a war in Myanmar. And as I said, right, you have two of the very poorest countries in the world and the largest refugee camp in the world. So, so the UN comes in and all these NGOs come in um, and whatever you want to say about that, or you want to give some examples. I am fascinated when the students talk about, a number of them have volunteered in, at that refugee camp and it's great, right? To, for me to find that out. But, you know, in your mind, you're just processing that. How does that link with other values with the problem of human suffering, with what suffering is caused by injustice and what suffering is just caused by human vulnerability. Do people blame God for this suffering, right? And if you unite reason and faith, you're not going to blame God for this. Um, okay. What about foreign policy? Power corrupts, right? Might makes right versus the golden rule. Okay. Do you think powerful nations should set the example? Do you have an example of a nation that doesn't or that does?
do you have an opinion on the death penalty or abortion? And I do want you to consider that this gets way out of proportion and women, women just really get on to other women for this, where bad politicians hide behind it. And in my country, it's just covering up their greed and it leads to more abortions. So I think you do need to distinguish between abortion is, is you think it's bad and you'll never get one. And what happens if it's made illegal in your country? What kind of corruption and injustices get hidden by this supposed protection of the unborn. So you have to be careful about that. Um, inequality, right? How important is getting a middle class in every country? And what are the obstacles to it? Stop ignoring climate change. Does your religious tradition uh, promote addressing climate change or does it ignore it? Does it say it's God's will or does it say God doesn't want us to destroy the creation, right? So what is, or do you just say keep religion out of it? This is about science. And then the Pope also, based on his Aristotelian um, foundation, he knows about a good political leader, statesmanship. You should worry about the legacy you leave. Um, and then he has changed on his stance about gay gays. He thinks, you know, leave it up to God to decide. He's not going to marry gay people in the church, but I think he's he allows them to come. And um, I think he, he thinks they should have equal civil rights. And I think at this point, he thinks they should be able to have civil unions. So he has gotten more liberal on that issue. But that's because of uniting reason and faith. There's no scientific evidence. There is scientific evidence that some people are born with this particular orientation and they're not morally degenerate. Um, it's not a choice for them. Okay, so what am I asking you to do? Think about whether you think these are universal values, whether they can be both religious and secular, and whether you think the UN is um, promoting what it is that Francis asks them to do. And you can talk about whether the leaders in your country respect the UN or respect Pope Francis or respect these principles or whether they maintain political power by breaking these principles. So then the next one, and again, I threw a lot of stuff at you. You don't have to try to cover all of it. 
Um, you don't, the main thing here is Martin Luther King was a prophet um, in the sense that he critiqued the political leaders and religious leaders of his time based on a higher standard of truth and justice and virtue, right? So he is definitely following in the same tradition of Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas, but also the kind of humanism that the UN is open to. You don't have to belong to any religion to be in the UN. Um, it's just there are these same, there is the same foundation with different wrapping paper, right? If you open up the wrapping paper, the doctrines, you could find the same patterns, right? Nonviolent civil disobedience. And many of you have examples. Myanmar is an example where the effort at nonviolence was uh, addressed with violence. And that's a big problem because then when the demonstrators get violent to protect themselves, the military has way more power. So it's it's just a bad situation. And then I think the UN, I'm not, they usually they try to come in, you know, with a peacekeeping force to stop it. But I'm not quite sure how that's going at the moment. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about these things. You could, if you want to think about how Martin Luther King refers to eternal law, you can think about that. If you want to think about how Martin Luther King refers to natural law, you can think about that. In the case of racist, racism is wrong. It's not natural, it's not God's will. So human laws that are racist, are wrong and somebody's got to speak out somebody's got to risk their life um and people can't just say well you have to wait you know a practical decision is about when to do this martin luther king said we've waited 240 years or 400 years i mean we've waited we, we can't wait anymore and that's a judgment call, right? About when, then where he talks about why he's in Birmingham, right? Why did I come? Well, I was asked to come. So who, what, when, where, why, right? Those are the practical questions. How and how, okay. So then there's the techniques of nonviolent uh, civil disobedience or uh, civil demonstrations. And this is a pattern, this is a, a blueprint that you could compare with Gandhi in India, or you could compare with some other movement in your country or something you've read about. Um, It's comprehensive again, it's systematic. And so what happens is if the segregationists, the people who benefit from the way it is, if they act violently or if they sabotage the movement, sometimes people just get the wrong impression. They get the wrong impression that it was the demonstrators that were violent. And um, so I think um, what I'm asking you to do is to make sure and understand that it's complicated. And if the news or if rumors start coming in, you start asking questions, right? Are you sure? How do you know, <laughs> right? Who said that? Who benefits from believing this, right? So 
that's what I just want you to get in the habit of thinking through things systematically and um, carefully. Let's see, there was the four steps. He did one, right, fact gathering. This is, this is all very sort of standard. Um, and this is what they get accused of. That also is standard way to put down these movements. Um, the church, okay. How many of you think the church should be involved in social justice? Because uh, my argument is, again, if you unite reason and faith, then church leaders ought to be always questioning political authorities and religious authorities, any kind of authority. Are you following the golden rule? Are you ruling for the benefit of the world? Are you giving away your wealth and your power in a way that promotes everyone's flourishing? You have to render an account so I think religious tradition should always be liberal, right? In a traditional sense of liberal, in the sense of AUW is a liberal arts institution. It's based on humanism. It accepts students apart from their doctrines, but it, but it focuses on these virtues and this habit of making authority accountable. Um, okay, and then I just had you read the first four or five pages. But the main theme there was for you to understand how this set of values and virtues has been woven into Western culture. But I really want you to, to say, well, what is it from this that I that is also part of my culture? And how has it been abused for colonial reasons, right? How have these people come in and use this stuff to oppress me? <laughs> and how is it, what can I salvage from it to um, not be oppressed, but also to develop a set of common values that my society can have as it moves forward. Because in developing countries, there does tend to be animosity between the secular humanists and religious conservatives, right? But there is this huge bridge. There's a huge possibility, which is the union of reason and faith, the union of spiritual humanist values with belief in higher powers, it's not inconsistent, the union of science and religion, the union of social science with religious values. So they can be woven together. Okay. Then we make this huge transition and I'm gonna let you take a break, right? We are gonna have a 10 minute break. I remembered. <laughs> okay, so it's 1018 and I will break till 1030. All right. All right. So I got to stop the share and turn off the recording. Okay. So now we are moving into the modern period where we're going to use scientific methods. We're going to look at facts, draw inferences, go back to facts. We're not going to make any conclusions about any universal view of human flourishing, right? Because that was used by privileged people to justify their privilege. And now we're going to have science. And we know that people are genetically equal. And we're going to we're going to structure society on the assumption that people are blank at birth and 
everything that they become, whether good or evil, is a result of how they were conditioned. And if we do enough social science and we get enough data about what sort of positive and negative reinforcements we can have, how that changes behavior, we can set up a society where people treat each other as equals and they don't, they, uh, they don't want to be greedy or they don't want greed or lust or sloth or pride or um, any of those vices, right? They've been conditioned out of those vices because the reason people had those vices was because of that class split, especially when it was baptized with religion, okay? That created all sorts of social poisons. And the belief is we can condition people out of it. Okay, so back to the modern modernity, right? The most, I would say the most influential um, movement in the modern world was utilitarianism. So I am going to just go through those outlines. There's three outlines. These are the basic fundamental ideas. And I'll stop periodically and you have your reaction to this idea. And then in the next post, I'll ask you about, can this idea be corrupted, right? But the first thing is let's get the ideas straight. So, this is the historical context where science, industry, and technology had led to these radical changes, just a revolution in culture um, based on empiricism. James Mill, okay. So here are the main ideas, the greatest happiness principle. So you judge good and evil, not, you don't refer to people's character. You don't refer to their, you just refer to their actions, something you can see, something tangible and measurable. Actions are right if they promote happiness, wrong as they lead to the reverse. Happiness is pleasure, the absence of pain right? That's science. That's what we observe. Okay. That's what we can change. Okay. So his belief, we don't act on our beliefs unless we associate them with pleasure or avoiding pain. So the real motivator in our, in our minds are our feelings of pleasure and pain. Okay, so here's one. Um, the essence of conscience. Do you think that your ideas of good and evil are simply the result of all your experiences and your um, the conversations people had about those experiences, all your emotions and the conversations you had about them and that everybody is molded basically entirely differently, right? So why don't you write down for a minute, what do you think the word conscience, right? Sense of good and evil. It's whatever causes you to call something good or evil is basically a result of your experiences and nothing else. Okay, go ahead.
All right. Next issue. Do you think the greatest happiness principle is the best foundation for judging good and evil because everybody seeks happiness, everybody avoids unhappiness, everyone associates happiness with pleasure, right? So this is the best foundation and you shouldn't have to prove it because everything is based on it. That's how you prove it, right? Everybody assumes it. Are there any problems with the greatest happiness principle? The nature of pleasure. Do you think this is true? That some pleasures are better than other pleasures and they're more pleasant in the long run, right? The pleasures of the intellect, empathy and engagement with the arts aren't as intense as sex or food or um, what? Taking revenge or something like that. But in the long run, they're, they're, they lead to more pleasure and happiness. And do you think everyone who's equally acquainted with both prefers the higher pleasures? Do you agree with that? Professor, could you please repeat the question? Do you agree that there are the higher pleasures, that they're more pleasant, and that everybody who's been exposed to both will choose the higher pleasures? Okay, here's the next one. Do you agree with his idea of happiness? Um, it's not a life of rapture, moments of such, in an existence made up of few and short-lived pains, many and various pleasures, a preference of the active ones, the intellect, empathy, and the arts. And in general, don't expect more from life than it is capable of bestowing, right? You can't have everything. You have a moderate view of what to expect. Do you agree that that is what happiness is? Do you think that empathy with other human beings is natural. The desire to be at unity with other human beings and that you can structure a whole society around empathy. You can structure it so you get rewarded for empathy. That's the way to get status. That's the way to be honored. That's the way to get promoted at a job. 
that's the way, right? You get all the social rewards if you have empathy. Do you think that is, um, that'll work? That's a good starting point for social engineering. Do you think that most people will agree that happiness, pleasure in the absence of pain means empathy with other people is the foundation for my happiness? Do you think most people agree with that or could be socialized? to agree with that. Does everybody understand the question? Is it okay? Do you agree that when people act like they prefer lower pleasures, it's society's fault because the society didn't give them a chance to develop higher pleasures? Okay, so let's see. Do you think that we can get people to run the new society who do seek the higher pleasures? Do you think it's possible or desirable to elect, that the public will elect these people or that somebody will put them in power and they can socially engineer the society so that everyone has empathy and pursues the higher pleasures. Do you think that's a good goal? Do you think it's a possible goal? Professor? Yeah? I have a question. Uh, professor, uh, I'm confused that whether male is saying that the only reason that people choose lower pleasure over higher pleasure is because of the society and because of their wrong upbringing. Or yep. is, this, is there any other cause? No, nope. that's the blank slate. Okay, Professor. Good. Good question. These people, these people really believed science and social science would truly save the world. 
and change human beings forever. So do you think there are people around who think that way today? Okay, so that's enough on that. That's one set of ideas. Bentham, do you think that his argument about everybody is just motivated by ple pleasure and pain. Is it, do you agree with him, right? It's either physical pleasure, political pleasure. You're, you're afraid you don't want to get put in jail, put in prison or fined, right? That's painful. So that's what controls your following the laws. Your morals, why, why do you follow the morality of the people around you? Because you take pleasure in their approval and you're pained by their disapproval, right? And then religious, why do you, you know, why are you generous? Why are you polite? Because um, you're afraid of going to hell or you take pleasure in the idea of going to heaven. Do you, do you agree with Bentham that everything amounts to pleasure and pain? That's it. Do you agree with Bentham that there's no higher and lower pleasures? There's just, as long as I don't hurt anybody else, I should be able to pursue whatever pleasures I want. Do you agree with that? Okay, do you agree with his way of calculating the pleasures and pains? Right, he had this huge long list of all the pleasures and pains involved and how you're going to calculate them. Do you agree that this is the way it should be done to make laws or policies or set up institutions. Everybody should go through this list of pleasures and pains. Do you think people will always end up with the same result? if they calculate all these pleasures and pains. All right, that's that set of ideas. Then, what about this one? 
Okay. Do you agree with the value of a free and open society? The only goal, the only goal for interfering with somebody else's actions is to prevent harm to others. And other than that, everybody else should be able to live however they like. But they have to be mature adults, right? All right. So do you agree that maximizing freedom should be the ultimate goal of every society? That's question one. Do you agree that this can only work if everybody is a mature adult? What happens if people are immature? All right, so the liberty principle, the only freedom worthy of the name is to pursue our own good in our own way, so long as we don't try to deprive others or impede their efforts. This is going to make for the best society, but you have to make sure children are conditioned appropriately. So do you agree that children should be taken out of the homes of their parents' homes if the, the utilitarian leaders decide they're not conditioning them to pursue the higher pleasures? Do you think that in order to have a free and open society, the state has to carefully monitor how every child is raised. Okay. Do you agree that intolerance is harmful? And that complete liberty, the freedom to contradict and disprove our opinion is the condition which justifies us in assuming it's true. Do you think it's good that Professor Beck presents you with all these contradicting points of view, and some of them will definitely challenge everything you've ever been taught. So does Dr. Beck corrupt the youth? Am I corrupting you by doing that?
more do you think it strengthens your mind, right? To have to be accountable for what you think. You can't just say, well, I think that because I was raised to think that. You know, we all know people get raised to think things that are wicked and wrong. So, so actually liberal arts education, one main cornerstone of it is this model of the free and open society. And it's always been designed to get students liberated from their unexamined opinions. Now they can end up with the same opinion, but it has to be based on reason. Okay, do you think that's a good thing? Most of the people who have ever lived in this world think it's bad and it's corrupt. Right? Because then you will be rebellious and you're, it'll will make you into a bunch of raving feminists and it will all be over and AUW corrupts these women and it's hopeless. They're never going to do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> well, what do you think, guys? A lot of people think that and I think you know that they think that, right? Do you think wrong opinions about sexism gradually yield to fact and argument? Or do you think certain people in your society will never ever treat women in a way that corresponds to the facts? Okay. All right, do you think Donald Trump is a good, was a good president? I mean, maybe you don't know anything about him, right? If, if some of you know nothing about him, fine. I, it's fine with me. He likes attention, right? He really wanted attention. So that's why I think probably most of you paid more attention than he deserved, frankly, but you could just use your own leader, right? Do you think your own leader is a good leader? Does your own leader maximize happiness? And then John, Donald Trump thinks he's a great leader because he's a good businessman and he structures everything to favor business and he raises his kids to be in his businesses. And that's how you create a good society. You create a good business climate. John Stuart Mill thinks feeding greed is the best way to end up uh, in a degenerate society with no middle class, okay? It's the pursuit of lower pleasures and it will destroy a society, it's immature. So which one, or do you have some third opinion, right? They really, really, really disagree. One, greed is the best way to happiness. The other one, greed is the best way to unhappiness. Okay, do you think countries should have a national health healthcare system, national child care, 
National uh, Promotion of the Arts, paid for by the government, mass transit, environmental law, public education. Do you think people and especially the rich should be taxed to have a strong middle class that's educated, healthy, um, exposed to the arts, exposed to the higher pleasures, right? And then you can say, does your country do this or not? Okay. All right. So that was that one. Now, another theme that goes on in this at every one of these views is what's the difference? Can a point of view be good in theory, but when it gets applied in practice, it gets corrupt, right? That's what happened with Aristotle. That's what happened with Augustine when it, the woman thought it crippled her psychologically. That's what happened with um, the Catholic Church when it was colonial, when it became part of Western colonialism. That's what happened with what? Um, I guess that's that was it. So these positions were corrupted in the past. And so they were thrown out. So the next question is, can utilitarianism be corrupted, right? And this is where um, Mr. Hedges says, yeah, and it is, <laughs> right? that Americans believe, you know, that America is designed to maximize everybody's happiness, pleasure and the absence of pain. And everything people do is justified as the best way to maximize happiness. But Mr. Hedges says, no, right? that everything has been corrupted by greed. Okay, let's see. So what he says is how is it, okay, remember a utilitarian would think public education is important, right? Because it promotes the higher pleasures of everyone. So John Stuart Mill would definitely advocate public education all the way through college until you can get a job, even grad school. Now, Mr. Hedges says, in fact, the institutions of higher education are being corrupted by greed. But people like Donald Trump think that allowing people to work hard, save their money, um, study, go to call, you know, take the exams to get into a college, get accepted based on their exam scores, um, that maximizes happiness, right? It's public education, everybody gets a chance. And the costs of the higher education, most of the cost is paid through taxes, but people have to pay something because you should work for it. All right. Mr. Hedges says, mm, that's not what's going on. Okay. And then again, John Stuart Mill would say, once you get into college, you should learn to think critically, right? It's a free and open society. Students who come to college 
are mature, they've gotten this far. Now we're going to develop your intellectual capacities. We're going to expose you to the arts. We're going to give you a sense of empathy. And we're going to get force you to re-examine everything you were ever raised with, right? So you have to think critically. All right. And Mr. Hedges says that's not what's going on. As a matter of fact, even at the very best schools, um, private companies, if you have enough money, you can get a higher score on a test. If you have enough money, you can go to the private high schools and they will prepare you for college. Then you'll get into the best college. What goes on in the college is that you just do what you're told, you get rewarded for it, and you get the best job, meaning highest paying, right? The students at the university are not questioning the free, to, free market, the value of greed. The system is justifying itself. There's a lot of, um, academics that are speaking in, in jargon. They don't care about the common good. The teachers just care that you perform in their class. They don't make any value judgments about what the student is gonna do with this grade in this class or with this diploma, you know? I don't judge other people. I'm, you know, that would be bigotry. All we do is give them the piece of paper. So there's no effort to care about the common good. Um, all right, so that's on one side. The people who educate for computer programming, technology, jobs that require getting high grades and all those um, science, technology, all those disciplines. Then people on the other side, they hate college educated people. They're elitist. And the college educated people tend to judge them. So there's this huge gap. Again, I'm not sure if this is true in your countries. Um, when students go to college in your country, are they motivated by money? And do they become snobs? Do they, are they become more and more hard hearted toward the poor? And then do the poor hate, you know, they don't like higher education. It corrupts the elite. It makes them indifferent to us. Um, then do you think you know, to be rational means to do everything in the way that calculates your personal economic self-interest. So that is not what John Stuart Mill said, but what about Bentham, right? If it makes me happy to go to college, I'm not hurting anybody else, right? I'm not harming anybody else. I've just calculated what I want in life and I want to go to college, get a good job. Let somebody else calculate what they want in life. <laughs> the trouble is it's not a level table, right? And what if you say, hey, Mr. Bentham, if, if everybody wants higher education and that'll make them happy, how, you know, how are you going to make it possible for everybody to get what they want, right? It's not because they wasted their money or time or energy. They're totally disciplined. But people on top are hurting other people because they can't get up there. So you need to tax them. Is that going to make them happy? No. Are they going to be convinced that they have to suffer the pain of being taxed? 
in order to maximize the happiness of other people? Are they going to think anybody can pursue anything as long as I don't harm other people? And I'm not harming anybody, but I don't want to get taxed because then that harms me, right? So then you end up with this huge gap between the rich and the poor and the rich are just saying, I didn't do anything, you know, I just seek my own happiness without harming anybody else. I'm free to do whatever I want. They're free to do whatever they want. So what's wrong? And <laughs> what else? People who make guns and bombs are calculating their own interest. They're not hurting anybody. They're just trying to be successful. So they go to Washington, DC. They lobby the politicians. Tell them, you know, if you, if we get this multi-billion dollar contract, we'll pay for your political campaign because everybody's happy. It makes everybody happy. We all need more bombs, of course. Okay. And the professors just say, well, we're going to talk about, we're not going to talk about that because that's judgmental. We're just going to talk about you decided to take this class, could it make you happy? And I like teaching this class, makes me happy. And that's it. <laughs> We're not going to talk about how the system fits together. Um, ah, he said when you sign up for um, clubs. Okay, so think about, and then I'll stop for a minute. And you can write down uh, your reaction to this. If my idea is, if you just tell everyone like Bentham, to seek happiness, as long as you don't harm someone else, you will end up with this huge inequality in the educational system. Is that okay? Then, next question, when you have your sign up night for clubs on campus, are all of them just personal issues or how many of them actually take a moral stand, right? Or criticize laws or um, institutions or habits. I mean, I remember one is animal protection, I think, right? So they would, they would be critical of certain behaviors, maybe certain countries allow for abuses of animals or something. So how many of those clubs I really have to do a citizen engagement in public life. And how many of them are just, I don't know, something somebody likes to do, like play checkers. And how many of them are the arts, right? Like a dance club or something. So let me just give you a minute to brainstorm about that. I know I went up there to the, I don't know, rooftop the night that they had the clubs. Cause I mean, I was just interested. And there was one for psychology, right? For some kind of counseling, you know, when, um, when the students are struggling. Or you can write about the clubs that you're in. Professor, can you please repeat your um, second question? The second one is, out of all the clubs you know at AUW, or the ones you're in, um, do they encourage citizen engagement? Do they encourage ideas about public life and critiquing institutions or laws? Or do they focus on developing a culture based on the arts? right? Or are they just tiddlywinks, right? Just hobbies or
interests that basically Bentham would say, who cares, you know, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, right? And I'm not judging that stuff either. I just think you have to think about how much of it is which kind of thing. Okay, so the main theme here is, do you think utilitarianism can get interpreted in a lot of different ways? And people will deny that their interpretations are corrupt, but you could think that some applications of utilitarianism are corrupt. They're not going to create the greatest happiness, right? But the people who make these decisions do think that overall, this is better for everybody than any other choice we could make, right? It's better to have fancy dorms that to have inequality in dorm life, in the food that's offered, right? Because if you pay more, you should get more because that'll make everybody happy. The other alternative is to force the rich kids to keep, you know, paying for the other kids. Okay, what about if a fossil fuel company gives a university all this money to do research, is that tainted money? Is that a corruption? Because it's not free inquiry, right? You have to, you know, do what they say. What happens if your research results come out saying that this kind of biofuel is really bad, has a terrible carbon footprint, but that's not what British Petroleum wanted to hear. So does that maximize everybody's pleasure? And that's what they're thinking, right? So the company gets research, they're happy. The researchers get money, they're happy. The school gets money. They're happy. The students get to do be TAs and go to classes and develop these skills. They're happy. In the meanwhile time, fossil fuels forever, right? The fossil fuel companies just keep getting more and more money for more and more research for more and more fossil fuel products. Is utilitarianism being misapplied, right? Next point, utilitarianism came out of the enlightenment at a time when the belief was that science could exploit nature indefinitely and it would make everybody happy, right? We've come to a point 
where we can't keep doing it or everybody's going to be pretty unhappy. But there just isn't that you have to look way far ahead to get there. And Bentham doesn't say, right? As long as I'm not hurting anybody, what, today, five years from now, 10 years from now, he didn't say that. What about mill, higher pleasures? He doesn't talk about it either. It's just the exploitation of nature was a non-issue. Okay, what about sports? Everybody's happy, right? We build these huge stadiums, we pay the coaches, but everybody's happy. They come, they like to go to the football game. We took a survey, everybody likes to go to the game. Okay, but tuition is rising. Management staff goes up 250%, employees 24, and the faculty go up 1%. But everybody's happier because you have more sports facilities and you don't really care if your classes are bigger. You care if they have a really good exercise room, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's the idea there that even these uh, institutions of higher education, they're thinking of utilitarianism, but it's actually becoming the rule of the rich. Then he talks about reading the classics. We're not learning the lessons of the past. We're losing our democracy. We're living in an illusion. The children of the elite have all these advantages. Um, so Mill and Bentham wouldn't want that, but it's all done in the name of utility. Okay, so that's, all right. So my main point there is, can a, can a theory get corrupted? without people realizing it's gotten corrupted. So people keep saying, yes, happiness, pleasure, no pain. This is fine, this is fine. And it's not fine, right? Can higher education get corrupted without people noticing? Okay, and then the next chapter was Positive psychology. <laughs> okay, should I give you a minute to talk about corruptions in the college? Are you guys done? Anybody need any more time? Okay, so I'll go back to what about positive psychology? This stuff is literally using psychological techniques emotional manipulation that's been learned about through lots of social science. Remember, the Enlightenment thinkers thought social science would condition people to seek higher pleasures and empathy, right? What's happening is all the social science are setting up to condition people to think they're happy as their lives start falling apart. <laughs> but they think they're happy and they're told just to think positively and everything will work out. Okay, all right. He really believes this. He's getting paid a lot of money. And um, so people are taught that their personal happiness comes from corporate profits. And it's like religion. It's like in religion, you're supposed to think that if you work hard, God will reward you. If you suffer, it just means you didn't work hard enough. If you keep praying and you keep faithful, you'll be successful or you'll go to heaven if all else fails. Okay, positive psychology. You just keep believing in yourself. 
You just keep thinking positive. Don't notice that the rich guy on top is taking more and more of your money. Don't notice that your environment's getting polluted. Don't notice, right? Just keep thinking positive. Um, if you visualize it, you'll make it happen. Don't think about what's going on under the surface. Happiness studies, okay? This is straight up utilitarianism. I hope you understand that. Does that make sense to people? This is what's happened to utilitarianism. She adds also, a Professor, I read a term on Facebook called toxic positivity. <laughs> I think this is where it's going. Okay, good. Is it an article that I that you could send to me? No, it's not an article. It was just a post where someone was saying that if there's a mental, um, if there's a person with mental health issues and people that are um, blinded by certain religious beliefs, and they say just pray to God and it's going to be fine. You're going to get through this if you keep trying. And yeah. Well, this so thing about this, that this is, yeah. the thing about that is that these people condemn religion, right? And they're saying, "Oh no, it has to be science based," but it's the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's it's annoying, right? Because they think, "No, no, 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 religion is bad." You know that's backward now we have social science but it's the same thing <laughs> and if you think critically right it's not necessarily going to make you happy other than to be happy because you know you can see through illusions right so you have to take pleasure in not trying to create illusions <laughs> It's a, you just have to decide what kind of a person do you want to be? <laughs> All right. And what do you take pleasure in? What's going to make you happy? Is that's what you really have to decide in college. No matter how dark it might be, I want to be an educated person. I want to be an informed citizen. I don't want someone to put, you know, delude me. I have more of a sense of dignity than that. But not everybody has that, right? The, the people who are teaching this stuff, David Cooperwriter, um, Shelly Taylor, they're getting paid a lot of money. And they're justifying this in the name of social science and education and enlightenment. And they just say, we nurturing these illusions is, is good, right? The other thing that really bothers me is when she says, there are three types of people, unrealistically positive views of the self, exaggerated perceptions of control, and unrealistic optimism. Well, who is she to say? you know, who, who, which person is worth more than another, so which one is getting diluted more than another, right? There's a sense, there's a kind of judgment built into this that I find really offensive. Um, but in general, everybody should, has, has the dignity where they ought to be respected enough not to be given illusions. I think that, I just can't stand that attitude. It's an attitude that, that I'm God, you know, and I get to, to brainwash you, but it's all in the name of happiness. <laughs> it's all in the name of utility. That's what you have to understand. We're done with religion. We've got utility, the new religion. Yeah. 
And then some of them are saying, look, it works for a while, but it collapses. And so that, that's what's happened in my country. The people who are going for Trump and conspiracy theories are the people that got manipulated into this stuff. And it crashed. And now everything is a conspiracy, right? Everybody's out to get them. It's just the opposite. But anyway, I want you to think about this in terms of your life or your country. Do your political leaders or social leaders, do they keep trying to pump you with optimism and cover up, you know, the ambiguities and the dark side of life? Does this happen in your society? Um, do you think mass coercion happens in your society? And this person, this psychologist, his defense, right? He says, oh no, this is scientific, you know? We've studied the vagus nerve. We know how the brain works. But, you know, you can't blame us if people use it to, you know, Nazism, right? To become fascist dictators. That's not our fault. <laughs> we give you the tools, but we, I mean, it's not up to us to think about how you might use them. That's just like Bentham, right? As long as you don't hurt anybody. I didn't hurt anybody by giving people these tools. Okay. Um, professional psychologists have used all their techniques to develop very sophisticated methods of torturing people, <laughs> uh, manipulating behavior. So that to me, that's one direction that utility went. So um, are there any questions about that? So the overall theme is how can a theory that looks good the first time around get corrupted, right? And that happens with religion and it happens with utilitarianism. Now we have Kant. That's the next thing. So why don't we take a five minute break and then we'll start with Kant. And I will change this one.
All right, so I hope everybody's back. Okay. So here's the other side of the modern world. The other view of reason. Okay. Reason is our capacity to make a body of scientific laws, right? So it's based on the concept of law. Then we have in our heads a distinction between when we're acting according to pleasures, pain, happiness, when we're treating ourselves as just an animal, and when we're acting on the basis of reason alone, okay? So we have free will, we can choose the temporal or we can choose to follow reason out of just a sense of dignity. And if we keep practicing following reason we'll gradually become aware of our freedom from all of those pleasures and pains. And we can learn to only ask ourselves, what is the right thing to do? What do I think everybody in this situation should do? Because it's right, not because of any consequences at all. It's the principle, it's the moral law. Okay, so, okay, let's see. This is, it's just exactly the opposite, right? Of utilitarianism. Um, let's see. All right, I'm not gonna go through all those distinctions. I just wanna give you this sense of how radically different these two views are. And then you think, okay, so Kant is more like Augustine instead of eternal law from God, Kant says, no, no, it's uh, moral laws structured by our minds. All right, we're just born with this filter through which we um, understand the world. Okay, so how do you teach a kid ethics? You don't teach them to take pleasure in doing good you teach them not to ask about what feels good at all. You just ask them, what's the right thing to do? So you develop the habit of judging actions according to whether the reason you're doing it is because it's the golden rule, it's the right thing to do. Maybe somebody will like me if I act that way, Maybe they will hate me if I act that way, but I don't care. I've got to act just on the basis of what I think everyone in that situation should do. Um, and you start taking pleasure in acting on the basis of reason. 
you become conscious of your freedom from all those other influences and that makes you happy um but it's a it's a different kind of happiness right it's the happiness that comes from pure reason and a sense of your dignity apart from any creature comforts but you you treat yourself like a rational being not like a mere phenomenon not like a natural creature um all right, so his examples. Let me go over here to his examples. Um, okay. So his examples are like a mathematical proof, right? He says, by definition, you understand you have this capacity to reason. The definition of reason is to act, capacity to act on the moral law. Right? So when you're deciding, should I commit suicide? You could say a rational creature by nature is aware of the infinite worth of having this capacity to act on a moral law. This is the most valuable thing in the universe is a good will and the ability to act for the sake of the moral law, okay? So if reason asks, can I kill myself? Can a rational creature of infinite worth kill themselves? No. <laughs> uh, a rational creature loves itself, not in an emotional way, just has immense respect for its own dignity as a rational creature. And nothing with that kind of respect will kill rational nature, kill itself. Okay, therefore, it's a contradiction, right? You can't be rational and kill yourself at the same time. The only motive you would have would be emotion, treating yourself like a thing and ignoring your, your infinite worth. So you couldn't possibly have a good will when you're act, if you kill yourself, right? Same with telling a lie. So reason thinks in terms of universals and it expresses those universals through language. Language is the tool of reason. And so, to tell a lie means to take that tool of reason and deliberately distort it, to mess with your mind. <laughs> you would reason would never do that, right? A good will that respects reason would never deliberately distort our reason by telling a lie. So the only motive would be inclination. So you cannot tell a lie, right? Telling lies is absolutely wrong, no matter what the consequences. Um, so no rational creature will make false promises, right? Which is to say things that you know do not correspond to what you're going to do. And so you, the, what, What's motivating you has to be inclination. It couldn't possibly be reason. Um, whether or not to cultivate a talent, okay? This talent belongs to you because of your rational nature. It's a part of your rational nature. So you cannot will for people not to cultivate their rational nature. Reason will never accept that. The only reason you do it is inclination. You don't feel like it, right? You could never will that to be a universal law. Okay, whether to be generous. Rational beings respect other rational beings as of infinite worth. So I have money, I can promote the well being of a rational being 
or I can keep my money. Well, no rational being could will not to help another one when, they, when it's possible. The only reason not to help would be inclination, pleasure, pain, and your own idea of happiness. So it's a contradiction. You can't do that. So the main point here is it is the opposite of Bentham, right? Um, so that's my first point. My second point is maybe Kant sounds good. How can Kant get abused, right? But let me go through this for a second. So this is the applications of Kant. And one of them, his essay, What is Enlightenment? Um, he, again, he is like John Stuart Mill in promoting critical thinking and a free and open society. So he also is saying, um, don't accept things, right? Have the courage to make use of your own intellect, okay? This is standard liberal arts, whatever, right? So, you know, act on the basis question, right? Don't accept anything without thinking about it. Um, all right. And he's very critical of people that just live by habit, that just listen to whatever the authorities say. But you have freedom, right? You have reason and you should use it. Don't listen to people who say, do not argue, right? Just obey. He's totally against that. Um, the public use of one's reason must be free at all times. I just think it's very interesting because it's a lot like Mill, but my goodness, the underlying view of reason is completely different, right? Um, and then how to educate children is completely different. For Kant, you, you educate them not to care about any pleasure other than the pleasure of being aware of your freedom and your reason. And of course, for Bentham and Mill, it's just constantly calculating everybody's pleasure. So, all right, so this is only five pages long. And um, I think, oh, it's, is it five pages with two? Okay, I can assign less of that. I didn't, I forgot that there's two pages on each page. Um, anyway, it's all right. Just eyeball it, spend, spend a certain amount of time on it. Some of you can read it faster than others. Um, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I guess it's seven pages. Um, I don't know. I can just trust you. Just look it over. Because the idea there is that the West has represented free and open societies, right? And developing countries have aspired to become more like that. Now, America is running into some real problems. Um, and so I think developing countries, it's a good time for people in developing countries to think more about these issues. Like how did America end up where it is? Well, a corruption of the ideas of happiness is definitely one of them. And then here's an example of a corruption of the Kant, right? The idea of a detached reason. Um, this one is about the ways that some people are using technology to just make themselves an extension of a machine, right? So um, that's one extreme, right? 
You just don't have any emotions other than you want to follow the number crunching. Um, you want to, um, I don't know, you want to program yourself. Um, I suppose, for example, you could have, you could know pretty much exactly how many calories you ever you ate and you can know exactly how many calories you burned in your exercise and you can know exactly this so you just really mold yourself to fit into some sort of rational model how much exercise each day how much of this how much of that and you like you don't enjoy life at all you just make yourself into this sort of machine um, so that this is, um, okay. All right. So living in this world of cyber, <laughs> right? Cyber world. And so I, I want you to think about, is it good to subject yourself to principles of reason, right? Is that virtuous? Because Kant would say that's how you develop a strong character. And there's an argument for it, right? So you just sort of entertain that. Um, well, I guess I have a few minutes. Why don't you write down what you can think that's good about Kant, right? What do you like about Kant's view? And then I'll talk about the Unabomber Manifesto and you could say, what don't you like or how could it get corrupted, right? But first we're gonna start with, what do you like about it? Okay, then this guy, I don't know if you know, if you've ever heard of the Unabomber, don't worry about 34 pages. I'm assigning you four pages. Don't freak out, promise. Um, he was a brilliant PhD in math from Berkeley. Good old Berkeley. That's what Mr. Hedges is talking about, Berkeley. And um, he decided that the direction that society is headed is toward a very, very few high-tech geniuses running everything and controlling people's minds, okay? And he, and he said, you know, they, they're gonna decide if they wanna destroy these people or if they wanna just pacify them and give them a bunch of mood altering drugs and make them like sheep. And so he said, um, I just wanna blow the whole system up. And so he put bombs in people's mailboxes and he just wanted to throw this wrench in the system because he had this feeling, this is just getting worse and worse and we're headed toward disasters. And um, I'm just gonna try to stop this. Okay, now my question to you, as I said with Kant, Kant is the beginning of that detached reasoning that led to skyscrapers, engineers, um, computer science, um, cyber, you know, um, let's see, all this, what, all that, constructed by reason, artificial intelligence, that's what I'm getting at, 
like Bill Gates was saying, you could take the human mind and put it in a different form, like silicon form, right? The way he thinks, he, you know, he thinks in a way that's totally detached from emotions, or he did. Then he got married and had kids and it was, he changed. <laughs> that's when he started to become a philanthropist is that he realized, oh, now I know what the other workers at the company are doing with their leisure time. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, and then Bill Gates also has uh, finally realized in 2006, which is really late for a smart person, that fossil fuels has got to stop. I can't believe, you know, it was so late. It was I figured this out in 1968, and he's my age, right? He didn't figure it out till 2006, which, you know, he has all the power, not me. But anyway, that's why he didn't think about it. Anyway, so, um, so the Unabomber just thinks it's the Sorcerer's Apprentice, it's out of control and the climate's going to get worse and worse and people get more and more desperate and so these few computer geeks are going to control everything uh, we won't have any autonomy um we won't the sources of the social it's really a good essay the guy is brilliant and he's very mathematical right he it's one thing follows another um and all I'm going to make how some people adjust. They can make themselves into zombies, the motives of scientists, okay, money and power, the nature of freedom. Okay, so, but the but restrictions of freedom are unavoidable in industrial society. So, um, yeah, technology is the most powerful social force. So think of how far we've gotten from happiness, pleasure, and pain, you know? Oh, wait, how do we get all the way over here? That's what I'm trying to show you, right? Um, okay, and then at the end, control of human behavior, that's what's going to happen. This is what, this is all I'm requiring you to read human race at a crossroads. Um, okay. Okay, it's one thing to develop a series of psychological techniques for manipulating behavior, right? That's what Mr. Hedges said, all that positive psychology is that, right? Um, it's another thing to integrate the technique into the functioning social system, right? And so he's picking up pretty much from what I, ch that chapter I assigned for you, um, blah, blah, blah. And so his conclusion um, is that he just wants to blow up the system, okay? And Let's see, I think, how many pages? All right. Yeah, I think it's just to page 23. It would be better to dump the whole system and take the consequences. And then he starts figuring the strategy he's gonna do. But um, so um, you could write about, I'm not gonna give you time, but the theme here is how did that really good idea or what you might have thought of as a good idea get corrupted, right? What happened? How did we get from acting according to reason to my God, a bunch of sheep and a bunch of techno, whatever. All right, so that's what I want you to think about. And then the other thing we'll talk about next time is moral relativism, all right? Um, and I have an outline that I'll go through with you about Benedict's article, but the article itself is not very long. Whoops, 
this is my paper and I will, I'll um, tell you in a post which pages to read. You don't have to read all 31 pages. Um, but this is what I do want you to read for sure. And it's not very long, two, four, six, seven pages. And I do want you to think about it. And I don't think it'll be hard for you to think about it. I'm sure you've thought about moral relativism before. So on your post, again, you don't have to post until after the next class but it might be easy for you to start taking notes. I think this is gonna be a post that you're gonna feel like oh, I can handle this one. Um, and then I will compare the relativism with Aristotle's virtues, but I do that in my paper anyway. Um, but here's what I want you to um, think now that, now that you've got this, hopefully this long list of notes, right? You can submit that as a post, but then those of you who are behind, just take out the little section related to post number one, two, three, four, and just elaborate on it, right? I, I do really want you to submit something for each one because, you know, the grading system, I have to have some kind of a common grading system. So please do that. Um, and I hope, you know, that I've made it easy for you, easier for you. So now you can see these connections and you can go do your posts. And I haven't scared anybody or caused any panic attacks, right? I really don't want to do that. Um, and then I will have office hours in a few days, right? I have classes four nights in a row. And then the next three nights are off or day, mornings for you, right? I have classes four mornings in a row and then three mornings office hours. If you want office hours before that, um, you can contact me, but otherwise, you know, I'll just sort of structure my week in a certain way. Um, and then hopefully you'll be ready to get all your posts done and also to start your papers. Any questions? There will, I will also post this YouTube video, right? And so you will be able to go over it again and again, however many times you want. And um, I hope that I hope that helps. Um, my main thing is for you to realize that that the UN's philosophy is just there, and there are people acting on it, and they are having effects on all of us. There are people with utilitarian beliefs, and it has having this effect. There are people with Kant, artificial intelligence, right? And so you have to figure out, well, what do I think? Does my idea of happiness get corrupted? Does it get corrupted by colonialism? Does it get corrupted, you know, how is, how is my judgment corrupted? Or what do I really want to think? Right. I do want you to think for yourself. Right. I'm a great believer in critical thinking. Um, but I do know that you have to be mature to do it, because in my country now, there are just millions of people that think the election was stolen and they have no evidence, but it makes them happy. Right. And they, they just are obsessed about feeling good. <laughs> and they've been taught, they've been conditioned not to think critically. And so once fear takes hold, it's the same lack of critical thinking. It's now that fear is driving it, not this fantasy life of positive psychology. Okay. I will, I will be quiet for a while and there's four minutes. 
and I will take questions and then I will stay until everybody's done with their questions. Um, professor, uh, when is the deadline for the post six? Well, I've told students there's no deadlines, but I'm gonna have to change that because too many people are way too far behind. So I will say a week after the class. One week after the class, you must get it posted. Right? Okay, that's fair. I just think you're killing yourself if you don't do that. And then if there is some definite reason just put that at the beginning of the post. You don't have to email me, right? Like, I know there's one student uh, that the electricity is down for a week. No problem. But otherwise, if you don't have any other reason other than, I understand you're all in very stressful situations. <laughs> um, I think I just give you more stress when I don't give you some kind of deadline, so. Uh, professor, just a personal thing to mention that uh, the other day uh, it, it should count as unexcused. Um, oh. <laughs> and, oh, my wish. An <laughs> honest person. Oh, my no, God. No, no, it's just um, for me, it's 4 a.m. here. So oh, at yeah. times I'm unable to wake up. And the other thing is um, I will most probably catch up with the writing the post this week. So do consider that. It's oh, just sure. up with like oh. next semester things, so yeah. Yeah, I actually am not going to grade people down up to this point. Yeah. Right? But I do think after today, you know, that I think I've, you know, I just think I wasn't that responsible a teacher. I didn't, you know, think about the difference between this and, and when we were all in the same room together and stuff. So um i you know i require a certain quality i'm not going to water down grades but i'm not going to punish you for handing in late and um and may wish you know i'm so tempted not i'm tempted to make it ex uh excused because i hate getting up in the morning <laughs> no, no, it's uh, in addition to that professors like i have um classes and presentations everything going on here um I'm doing an exchange semester. So it's at times it's very hard for me to manage. So it's just uh, for the post, I'll catch up this week. Okay, that's good. <laughs> well, I'll just give you one unexcused and I'll just ignore <laughs> for a while anyway. <laughs> I'll be glad for that. I think you get a couple of them, don't you? Before the AUW comes after you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else have any comments or questions? I think I'll stop the recording, right? And <laughs> they wish you're on a recording forever. I'm sorry. 